30 years since I'm a lectionary preacher, this scripture reading comes to the top. And we get to hear about the baptism of Jesus. And it's one of my favorite scriptures because there's so much in it. We've heard about the power of Jesus and the power of God in our song this morning. Isaiah fleshed it out a little bit more. Hear Luke and what he says and what adding it all up gives to us. From Luke chapter 3, we're talking about John the Baptist. Now as the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or whether he wasn't, John answered saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Barbara Brown Taylor is a brilliant woman. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with her or not in her writings. She's an Episcopal priest. She's an author. She's a theologian. But she's just not some academic, really cool person. Time Magazine in 2014 named Barbara Brown Taylor as one of the 100 most influential people in the United States. And when I think of academics and people that are published in this, that, and the other, I think sometimes that they're not like us. That they're up in their ivory tower and they may feel things a little bit different. But Barbara Brown Taylor talks about her grandmother. And in telling about her grandmother Lucy, I realize that Barbara Brown Taylor is just exactly like we are. She had feelings so great and memories so great about her grandmother, Lucy. And Lucy was a one. That's O-N-E-R. She was unique. She had lost both of her legs to diabetes. And instead of getting normal looking prosthesis, she just got wooden stumps. She was perfectly happy with that. And she had very weak, myopic eyes, and she had to wear Coke bottle glasses about this thick. And most of the time, now this is going to complete the picture, she dressed like a bomber pilot. She enjoyed being a little bit different. But to her grandchildren, to Barbara Brown Taylor, Lucy was wonderful. And whenever Barbara would visit her grandmother, she said grace was everywhere. It was abounding. She would go in the door and go to hang up her coat, and she would open the closet door to hang it up, and there were gift-wrapped packages in that closet, whether it was Christmas, or whether it was April, or whether it was whatever it was. And there was one gift-wrapped package for each day of Barbara Brown Taylor's visit with her grandmother, Lucy. And aside from the packages, oh my, now this is what some of us would remember, the meals were delicious. And they always included Barbara Brown Taylor's favorite dessert. And 
this is a girl thing, there were the shopping trips. To buy cute little pink dresses, to buy hair bows, to buy patent leather shoes that matched those cute little dresses. But the thing that capped it all off was about 8 o'clock at night. Each night of the visit, when Lucy would go, and I'm going to use an archaic term now, and draw a good hot bath in the bathtub. And the bathtub would fill almost to the top with bubbles everywhere. And Barbara Brown Taylor would get in that bathtub, and we all know how good a good hot bath feels. And Barbara Brown Taylor said Lucy would take a great big sponge and would practically polish her body with that sponge from top to the soles of her feet. And then when she had dried off, Lucy would take a bottle of a good old white Jergens lotion. How many of us grew up with the smell of Jergens lotion? And just slather, slather the little girl all over her body with Jergens lotion and then to cap it all off. She would lie on the bed or stand there in front of her grandmother while her grandmother took a great big blue powder puff and just beat the fool out of her with evening in Paris dusting powder. And Barbara Taylor said that after several years of this, it would absolutely, it finally absolutely sank into her mind that she was precious. That Lucy felt a love for her that embraced her and enveloped her. And Barbara Brown Taylor says she could never, ever, and never wanted to escape that conviction that she was precious. Well, the scriptures this morning give us different pictures of God. One in the book of Psalms that we read for a call to worship is this picture of Hercules and Herculean might. The other is a picture of mercy. One presents a God of glory. One pre presents a God of grace. And in one bold parrot stroke, we see a big <coughs> Lord of lightning. And in another stroke, in softer tones, we see this lavish Lord of love. And both of these pictures are true pictures of God. In Psalm 29, if you remember what you read and what I read, we heard and meet the voice, a powerful voice, a majestic voice, a voice that thunders, a voice that's strong enough to break the cedars and it flashes forth and it makes the oaks whirl in the breeze and strips the forest bare. This is God that we don't want to mess with. We don't want to see Him in a dark alley. We don't want to meddle with Him. But then, then in the Gospel lesson, when we meet John the Baptist, we see that he worshipped this kind of mammoth, mighty, master God. And he was worried that the Messiah to be would sweep into wilderness like a refiner's fire, consuming human sin. And when I say human sin, that's collective. Let's break that down. He would sweep into this world, consuming my sin and your sin. And if they were just twigs, maybe, in a Boy Scout's tinderbox, as he tried to make his first fire there. But much to John's surprise, and probably to his disappointment, the God that he expected, the God of muscle, the God of might, was not the God who arrived. The mighty Messiah that he envisioned turned out to be the gentle Jesus. Rather than a military man who had come and lord it over his subjects, we meet instead a mild, modest man, Clark Kent maybe, who waded into the muddy water and he chose to be a companion with those he had come 
to serve. The two conflicting images that we have of the Holy Spirit included in Luke's passage underline the difference between John the Baptist's expectations and what Jesus really was. For John the Baptist, for John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit was going to be and was a, like a ferocious fire and it represented the judgment of God. But when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, what was it like? It was like a dove, like the Noah's Ark dove that we saw in the Old Testament that marked the end of God's judgment. The fire God, the angry God of the Old Testament is replaced by the dove God and the love God that we see at Jesus' baptism. In all the gospel accounts that describe the baptism of Jesus, there's one common question that runs throughout, and it's a question that you and I might ask also. Why was Jesus baptized? Why did he need to be baptized? After all, <clears throat> according to the Baptist, to John, baptism was for the purpose of repentance and the forgiveness of sin. You tell me, of what did Jesus need to repent? And what did he need to be forgiven for? Actually, if you think about it closely, this one who was to be baptized by fire, he never baptized anybody else. Instead, Jesus said, submitted. He said, okay, to the waters of baptized baptism. And he kneeled there in the mud, in the muck, in the mire. Why? Did you ever stop and think about that? Why? Well, it follows the thinking for the same reason that he was born in a manger. The same reason that he ate with prostitutes and tax collectors. The same reason that he cried and he prayed and he slept in a garden the same reason that he died a painful, human, oh, so very human death. So the answer to the question is why? Because he came into humanity. He came to Bethlehem that night quite simply so he could be like us and so we could grow to be like him. Jesus was baptized there that day by John the Baptist. He was baptized into our humanity so that we could be baptized into his divinity. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, those who are baptized in the same pool or in the same font become siblings. They're considered the same flesh and blood. They are kin with each other. And in this sense, when Jesus was baptized, he became siblings with the crowd and with all of those with whom he was baptized there in the River Jordan. When we are baptized into Christ, whatever waters we find ourselves, wherever we are, we too, and this is good news, we too become siblings with Christ and with one another. Now, you may have had better thoughts, John Bennett, but you and Mark Rutledge are brothers. That may go both ways, Mark. <laughs> They're shaking heads back there. You know, we're kin folks. We have the same legacy. How wonderful that is. And after we become siblings with Christ, and after we become siblings with one another, the personal name that we receive in our baptism is important, but much more important than the personal name is that spiritual name that we received when we were baptized, baptized, Christian. That's what we become. And Christian has really one meaning. We are the bearer of Christ. And we're also the brother and sister of Christ. I love the story that I found about a Presbyterian pastor talking about one of those embarrassing moments in ministry. And I've been there and I've done that and oh my, is it? 
And he was in the middle of performing a wedding ceremony, and he was just about to lead the young man and the young lady through their vows, 